And again, you can, you can see the top 25 cities there and what's happening with the price for one bedroom and both two bedroom properties. If we go to our San Francisco market area, you can see San Francisco and the neighborhoods around it and, and what they're getting on an average price um, for a unit in those areas. Again, quite, quite expensive. If you take the same thing with San Francisco, you can see what's going up, what's coming down. And then we're gonna also go to, um, go to the Los Angeles market with Santa Monica, um, and obviously uh, Brentwood right next door to us, but Santa Monica being the top and, and outpacing that of even Beverly Hills. And you can see a lot of our core markets, even our Newport office, which is on the phone here, um, is in the, it rounds out the top five. So Los Angeles, Newport, um, Santa Monica, these are our core market areas that we, our offices work, and we are in the very, very top of the entire counties that we're working in. So, so I thought that it would be helpful if we brought together some people um, to really talk about what they're seeing from their positions, both in Northern California um, and Southern California. So with that, um, I wanna have Alicia Shepard, for those that don't know Alicia. Alicia really helps me on the commercial side, both uh, in Northern and Southern California, really works and also uh, runs the Nucleus Training Program. And I thought um, it would be helpful if Alicia and I really worked with a panel of, of our agents to kind of um, ask some questions about what's really going on up there. So with that, I wanna introduce um, our four, uh, four panelists for today. So if you are not taken off mute, Lynn, please unmute. Uh, Tim Brown and Tim is in our San Francisco office and and um, Tim uh, Tim has done a lot of new development um, Tim brought in uh, his company with us in San Francisco and and he's really focused in the multi um, multifamily development space a lot of mixed use uh, has a lot of properties that he he uh, oversees and that he owns and Mark Von Canel is our partner in, in Las Gatas Carmel is the operating principal there um, also separately owns his own property management company and he does a lot of uh, residential flips as well. Michael Pagonis is in our Oakland office, does uh, multifamily investment sales with his brother and then they have a third partner as well. And then we actually have Michael Tovig as well from uh, the Santa Monica office and Michael is on the team with Step Commercial which, is, uh, which won the award for the number one commercial um, agent in, in all of Keller Williams this year again two years running. And so I thought it would be helpful for Michael to also weigh in with us on some of this. So let's get right into our, our discussion here. And, and I want to start the conversation uh, with saying, what are you guys seeing in, in the rental market in your local area on whether, on whether rental rates are coming down or the impact of things such as, you know, um, you, you know, they're not able to evict people. What are you seeing? And I know Tim, you, um, why don't, why don't we start with you, Tim, on, on what you're seeing in the rental market? Great. Hello, everyone. My name is Tim Brown. Um, I generally only work the San Francisco market. Um, in our market, can everybody, am I coming through, first of all? Yes. Yep, we can uh, see you. Okay. Here you. So in, in, in San Francisco, um, between my properties and other clients, we're getting on the residential on a residential level, about 92% pay payments from tenants, um, which is pretty good. Um, for for the most part, um, I would say everybody, and I, I only have one tenant not paying, which is much better than the 92% level. Um, and that's been true all through April, uh, March, April, and May. Um, the big change that has occurred uh, this last week is it seems like even though the economy is starting to open up, the tenants, not so much in San Francisco, but throughout the nation, but the tenants uh, seem to be fed up with staying in their units. So either they're buying or moving. I've, I've, had, uh, I've had about a 5% uh, notice to move come in the last week of my portfolio, which was astounding because I've been running it at almost 100% uh, 100% occupancy. Um, so that just kind of threw me for a loop. Um, but what, what we've really been hit with the most is the commercial, the commercial no pays. Uh, we're running, uh, I have clients that have 
3,200 units, 1,500 units, uh, bigger portfolios or bigger management companies. And on the, on the commercial level, we're running about 50%, 50 to wow. 60% payment. And that is a killer. Um, you know, a lot of these smaller mixed use properties that have, for instance, one commercial or two commercial and five or six residential, uh, a good part of your, your monthly income is coming, being generated from the downstairs restaurant or bar or clothing store. And, uh, and now they're either not paying at all or partial paying at best. Okay. A lot of the commercial storefronts, as you guys have probably seen on the news, are boarded up in San Francisco just to protect the inventory. That, that, that's true in almost all of our market areas right now is boarded up across all, all the cities because we've had, again, San Francisco or Santa Monica last Sunday uh, was one of the epicenters. And of course, Oakland really saw that as well. Um, so Mark Von Kainal, so Mark, you want to share your perspective on what, what you're seeing as well? Yeah, you know, you started this out asking, you know, how many of us have seen the, the market kind of come back? And I think we're all seeing that, but I'm very cautious on what's going to be the long-term impacts as additional industries are going to be, or are being impacted. Um, you know, kind of piggybacking off of what Tim was talking about, in our area, Santa Clara County, so I, I own, uh, obviously I'm the OP of several KW um, offices, Los Gatos and Carmel. In addition, I own a pretty large property management company here in Santa Clara County that does um, both commercial and residential. And on a residential side of it, on the rent deferrals, um, we started off about a 5% of our tenant uh, who are on the deferral programs. We believe it, it's tapping out at around 7% on the residential where they're asking for the deferral programs. One of the challenges is nobody's really signing the, uh, the payment pledges because they simply can't guarantee when they're going to be making those payments. So that's what we're seeing on the residential rental side of it. Um, office wise, we don't have any of our users having an issue with deferrals on the office use. Where it's really hit is, as Tim mentioned, is the retail strip centers. Um, we're about 50% for the retail restaurants. Um, and, and we don't know when they're going to be able to reopen and, and pay anything at all. Um, what's interesting is that on the rental side of it, Things are starting to soften a little bit, every so slightly, but everything from occupancy rates increasing just like one point, um, the absor absorption of the units, um, rent growth, everything's starting to st stall out on us and kind of retract just a little bit, but I think that's an indicator of what's to come. We are seeing a major reduction in student housing. So if we look around our rentals around downtown San Jose or on San Jose State, uh, Santa Cruz, that's where we're seeing the largest increase of vacancies. Um, so that's kind of what we're seeing and, and on values, values have been staying pretty the same, but you know, with our multi-residential units that have been in families for years where before there was a, a value add for purchasing those 70% below market and be able to increase those rents by fixing them up. We're now seeing those properties have diminished in value quite a bit because now with 1490, uh, 1482 that, you know, we can only increase that 5%. So, and that was happening before the virus. So. Uh, I'm very cautiously optimistic, but I'm also hesitant about where this is going as it's continued to hit industries. I played golf with um, uh, one of the executives for uh, Granite Construction that has several major projects in the area for high rise office and they're getting very nervous because as people are looking at lowering that footprint for, um, you know, they're, they're getting very nervous on these projects that are building out 200 to 500,000 square feet of office users. Um, and those well, you're making, a, you're making a good point, Mark, because we were talking about like, if you're in the Salesforce tower and they're only letting four people up an elevator at a time, how are you going to logistically get that line to go up these elevators and go to these high rise buildings yeah. in, in this COVID environment? You could have at six feet, six feet apart, you could be having a line down the block just to try to get up to your building. But then the problem is you get up to your building uh, up to your floor, you don't want to go down for lunch because you can't wait to get back in that line again to go back up. So therefore, all the small little restaurants around there will not be will not be um, getting even a portion of their um, their businesses back that were relying on that that lunch crowd, right? So yeah. so I think that that's going to be an impact. Yeah, we were having a, co a conversation regarding that that footprint and that while businesses are, are letting a lot of their users go remote, they're also realizing that. You know, your, your remote workforce is not 100% effective. So there's going to be those, those key employees that you're going to want to collaborate in person. So there will be that side of it. 
And then the footprint has changed from the sense that, you know, instead of having two feet, uh, two feet distance between your employees and having a 36 foot um, model for each employee, they're gonna have to be six to, to 10 feet aside. So if you are, you know, so there is that argument that those larger footprints might be needed if you're gonna keep your workforce in place, but all that's yet to be seen. But overall, you know, I'm a little um, concerned about the long-term impact of this as the other industries are being hit. Um, but right now, today, residential things are on fire in a primary we're still seeing multiple offers and everything um but it is that question where are we going to be at three to six months from now okay and, and before we move on um mark i want to ask you about like areas like let's say tahoe because i know you have a place in tahoe are you starting to see places like i we're seeing palm springs and tahoe and like napa and russian river and half Moon bay and areas maybe carmel like areas that are a little bit further out, but if you needed to go to a meeting like in San Francisco or like for us in Los Angeles, yeah. you could drive in for a day, do meetings, and then get back to your principal house. We're seeing the markets that in previous downturn cycles that people would sell their second homes and keep their first homes. What they're doing opposite, they're staying in their second homes, selling their first home, and yet, and, and yet what they used to do was sell their, sell their boats, sell their RVs, and those areas are all increasing. So the boat sales are going through the roof, RV sales are going through the roof, and second home areas are actually increasing while core dense high-end market areas, I, I think are more of a problem spot. We're, we're seeing exactly that. I mean, Tahoe has seen a resurg resurgence in you know, the purchasing of second, second homes or, or now to be first home, especially on the Nevada side because of the tax benefits. It's funny, I have a buddy that has an RV center and he was almost going bankrupt before this their sales have increased by 250%. Yeah, speaking from someone who's buying an RV today. <laughs> <laughs> so I think this whole process <laughs> yeah, just really showed. Something to it. <laughs> I yeah. don't want to get on a plane, so we'll be in an RV. So Michael, Michael Pagonis, um, uh, I wanted to um, have you weigh in. What, what are you seeing there? Yeah, so thanks, Rick, for having us. Um, yeah, you know, in the open market, like everyone else, we've been, you know, on pause now. I think that's had a lot to do with just what's going on in the financial markets. But now that things are starting to soften and, and open up, you know, we're starting to see some some opportunity. Um, the lenders we've been speaking with are getting back now down to pre-COVID terms. And so, you know, we're starting to see some more activity on our, on our multifamily listings. As far as um, you know, rents and vacancies go, you know, in Oakland, we haven't seen too big of a, of a hit as far as vacancies. People have been sheltering in place. Um, it's been difficult for them to, to move. Um, but as far as rents go and collections go, we're still in that, you know, high 80, 90 percent percentile as far as uh, rent collections. Um, I, you know, I think as far as, uh, you know, us you know, moving forward, I think we're going to be able to, you know, continue with that. We'll see what happens as, you know, some of these um, PPP loans start to soften up, you know, here in July and see how many people are going to be able to continue to pay rent. But overall, you know, we've been surprised with the collections with the average. Okay. Um, and, and what are you seeing in the actual sales side? Because again, one of the challenges we have is um, what happens when you're trying to sell a 20 unit uh, apartment building and you have to try to get 20 different tenants to agree to a, signing a P and you want to show a property to sell it. How has that been affecting you? Cause I know that that was a challenge. Yeah, no, it, it has been. And, and, you know, what we, what we found is, um, you know, it really comes down to communicating with the tenants. Um, we've had to take a more personal approach as opposed to just posting, you know, a 24 hour notice. On their door, we've been proactive in working with the management companies and getting their contact information, and you know, making calls and really try to walk them through, you know, the steps and the current laws that are in place to uh, to show them. It's, it's still difficult. It, it, it's still going to be a challenge. You do, you are going to get that pushback, and but you know, again, we're slowly trying to work through it. I think again, as the shelter in place continues to soften and things kind of get back to somewhat normal, tenants are becoming a little bit more open to, you know, allowing you, and they understand that, you know, we need to get into their unit in order to make the sale. And so it's just kind of working, you know, together to try to accomplish the same thing. Okay. And, and Michael, um, are you guys seeing the same thing? Like in, uh, again, you guys with Step Commercial do, um, do a ton of business in Long Beach. Are you guys experienced the same thing with difficulty in getting in there because of the PED requirement? 
or Mike Toveg, right, Rick? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry, I was, yes, Mike Toveg. See, on mute. Sorry to bug you. I managed to, I managed to get into Zoom, but I can't hear them talking. Do you know how to change the? Is Mike on here? Anyway, I'll st Oh, it's slow. So let me just fix. Well, we'll come back to that. When you, Mike, when you get on, uh, let, let us know that you're, you're on. Um, but Alicia, go ahead with your own. Yeah, I mean, what I, I think was so interesting to see that I'd love to hear perspective from you guys was how much the rents are trending downward and the difference from like San Francisco of nearly 10% to Los Angeles of 3%. I think in the, in the next 12 months, we're going to see the lending relationship with how we value apartments look really different. Just investment, residential space, period. You know, what, what kind of feedback are you guys hearing from lenders on what they want to see on pro forma numbers and the, the speculative numbers of what a, an apartment rental could get versus what we might have been doing five, six months ago? I think now, I think right now, I think it's important as uh, things start to loosen up and the lenders come back to the market. What they're asking for is uh, uh, documented tracking rent collections. So how many tenants are on some type of hardship or payment plan, and then certainty of being able to collect those rents. And I think being able to, to, to prove to the lender that you're going to have the solid collections, I think that like Mike mentioned earlier, they're starting to, to loosen up. In the middle of it, kind of April, May, they're underwriting a lot of our apartment deals at a 10% vacancy, which yeah. just totally crushed loan to values. And so now they're going back to, you know, five to 3%, depending on the market. So if you can provide them with certainty of collections, I think the lenders will start to loosen up and we'll start to see uh, some of these banks. We've been working a lot with, uh, Luther Burbank, um, Chase tightened up a bit. And then there's a, a few local uh, credit unions. Uh, was it Pro, uh, which one is it? First, First Foundation. First Foundation. And yeah, they have a great that, multifamily lending platform. Yeah, yeah, they've done a great job here in our local market. Well, in First Foundation, because I know we have a lot of residential agents on the call, if you're working with investment real estate, one unit's up through four, First Foundation has one of the most competitive platforms. But they're going to want to see, and tell, tell me if you guys are seeing this, they're going to want to see like proof that the income can come in and that your pro forma rent is not saying, here's the highest this market does, or if you renovated the property fully, here's what it would be. They're going to want to see in the condition it is today, here's what you could get for that space. Correct. They, they require a lot more paperwork than let's say a Wells or a Chase or one of the larger lenders. But if you could get through the process, a lot of times they offer better LTVs and lower interest rates. Yeah. You know, and the other thing I think about too, Tim, you mentioned, you know, your retail space is really suffering from a developer standpoint. What does that do for your pipeline over the next year or two? And does what you're developing change? Are you going to change the footprint of what your core development is? Um, well, luckily the development is all residential coming. So, um, awesome. but from, from that standpoint, yeah, everybody's going to be cautious, including the lenders. I've seen, um, first Republic has been much more cautious than they have been on, on everything. I've had lenders want to, um, have one year's rent held back in escrow on a cash out refi or a purchase sometimes. They don't want, they want you to be responsible for the, for the downslope and or the downside of, of uh, no rents coming in. So they'll, right. they'll, they'll be taking your, if your, if your month, if your annual rent is $200,000, they want that left in an escrow account uh, to assure them that, that, uh, that you're going to, you're, whether you get paid or not, they're going to get paid with, with uh, impounds. So right. yeah, there's there's a lot of caution in the wind. I mean, the, the a lot of discussion around only fifty. You know, San Francisco is a, a, a restaurant town, a party town, and there's a lot of discussion around only fifty percent of the the restaurants and bars opening after after we get out of this. And yeah. and uh, and that's generally your highest paying tenant, probably in all of these communities we're we're discussing. But that's in in our in our arena. That's that's your your best paying tenant, which means, or highest paying tenant. So if that gets reduced from a bar to a restaurant to some other type of use, then of course your income goes down and your cap rate goes down and, and uh, your ability to borrow goes down. Right. 
I think COVID kind of showed us the, the, the hurdle or the gap with the live, work, play, dense urban community development cycle that we've been in in areas like Los Angeles and San Francisco. What do you guys see being the trends that follow where, where are multifamily tenants or are renters going to move to in the next 12 months if, if work isn't as committed like they have to be right on top of it? All of the roommate situations that we're in, that seems to be the biggest vacancy right now. Mm. Um, we have a lot of uh, housing, you know, generally in San Francisco, like a, you're looking at a, approximately 2,000 bucks a room for a lot of tech, tech people or, or, you know, a four bedroom is 8,000 a month, three bedroom is 6,000 a month, two bedroom is four, 4,500 a month. And, um, but it seems like predominantly the, the vacancies are coming from the roommate share situations, particularly if, if one roommate has been out of the country or traveling a lot or moved back with their family. So once that lease expires, they're out of there. Um, and, and, um, so that's that's what I see uh, before the before the multi the multi bedroom units were golden because there were so many tech workers and so many younger people would rather be in a community communal situation rather than be in a, a studio or one bedroom by themselves. I think that's the biggest shift I'm seeing in the market here. Interesting. Is if Mike Toveg's on the line, I know Long Beach probably had one of the more conservative rental communities from everyone on the phone. Um, it'd be interesting to hear. I, they haven't shifted nearly as much as the rest. And so I, I imagine their vacancy and their, their fallout from this is a little softer than the rest of us. Seems like he may not be on. No, he's not. Okay. Um, and, then, and then if you guys could give... Um, if you look forward and things like that, if, if you got some, um, you know, how, how do you see the commercial rental market impacting like first time home buyers by people like Tim, you were saying people were not renewing and, and, and moving elsewhere. Are those people moving into more rental or do you see people converting into residential sales for the, for the residential people on the line here? Are you guys seeing that um, transition from people leaving? We're seeing, um, we're seeing several things. Any, any tenant that vacates any of my units, I make sure that my property manager asks them why. What's the reason? Where are you going? Why are we losing you? Because I, I want to, at this stage, um, I learned from 2000 with the dot-com bus that when somebody's moving, you want to know why and, and uh, be willing to negotiate the rents down rather than have a vacancy for two months and lose anything you, you may have uh, thought you saved. Um, and some of them are moving in with their parents. Some of them have, because of the, the, the situation with tech where uh, they're allowing a lot more work from, uh, work from home situations, they're realizing they can move to a, a more rural environment like Marin County um, and work from home or even further, further than that, work from, work from home and maybe come in once a week. Um, so we're losing some people to that. Um, I think some people are, 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 are kind of fed up. It's just like 90 days in a small studio or small unit where we're losing those two. And uh, some of them are, are just saying, I think they're seeing a break in the, for the first break they've seen in years in the market from a rental perspective. And they're, they're just trying to take advantage of the fact that maybe they can move to a, a bigger place for the same or less money than what they're paying in one of my rentals or, or other rentals. Um, so a lot of that, I have not on, on, on my portfolio and most of my clients, if a tenant has moved in maybe in the last three to four years, I have not, when the, when the rents have been, when I've been allowed to increase the rents, uh, I have deferred any rental increases over the last two years um, just to avoid a vacancy. I, don't, I didn't want to tempt them with a, with a rent increase, even though we were limited to ridiculous like 1.8% or 2%. I just didn't do it because the, the market wouldn't sustain it. I would have a month or two vacant to get the same rent or maybe a little less than what I had. Um, and now um, I'm seeing uh, with the vacancies I've had, I'm gonna be re-renting them probably 10% above what they were rented for before 
um, and that's without two, two years of increases. So 10 to 15% I see is, is an immediate, immediate drop based on the uh, higher vacancy factors and people wanting to negotiate. Okay. Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I can tell you what we're seeing and, and we're anticipating more of this is as we're talking, which is relevant to the residential agents on the, on the phone, the individuals who are looking at that pre-retirement scenario that have lived in their homes here for that 20 plus years, there's a lot more discussions about now more than any time, it's time to get out of Dodge and move into some other you know, areas across the nation or just uh, change their surroundings. Um, we're also seeing a lot of the tech workers that were renting or turning to sellers, you know, they're saying, listen, we no longer have to go into an area where affordability is an issue because we're paying a thousand bucks a foot to purchase a piece of property. We can now go into Gilroy or some of the outlying areas that we have for half the price um, because they're not, to your point earlier, Rick, you know, they can come to the office one day a week or they can do the majority of the work remote. Um, and we're anticipating more of, uh, of those issues rising as time goes on. Um, again, the vacancies, we haven't really been hit too hard with them except for in our student housing mix. But I, I would also expect that we're gonna start seeing some increase. Again, I don't see it as a nosedive, but I, I do, uh, we're anticipating about a 10% correction on our, on our vacancy rates. I think across the state, I mean, in, in California, which our two regions tend to be the biggest areas, over, over three dozen technology companies have already very loudly said, we're reducing our office footprint by 50%. We, we've already adapted to have people work from home. We're going to keep that. I think that's a leading indicator for the entire rental market of we're going to see more people move out of these urban cores into the secondary mm -hmm. tertiary markets where they can. So it, 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 it honestly is probably price correcting our markets a little bit more than dipping them because we had, we'd gotten really, really high and who knows how long that was sustainable. But I, I think that's something, the more we acknowledge that and work with it versus like resist it, I think we'll, we'll be better positioned to help clients make good decisions. Well said. Do you, guys also, do you guys also see maybe converting of some of this office building, especially creative office space into live work apartment and, and creating a higher, um, if, if, the, if, the, if the office market drops the highest, which we believe to be true, retail office, could you see at least some of the office creative side to be um, converted into residential living? If local zoning will allow it. If local zoning will allow Like in it. Los Angeles, that's going to be a nightmare to fight. It's one we're going to have to go through. But it took years to start to, to get allowable live workspace. And now we're going to take years to try to get more of it. I mean, in, in Westside, we have Cumulus, which is over 100,000 square feet of brand new office space. They're finishing out right now. And they've already tried to go in for an appeal and got immediately denied for it. So I, that will, it'll be a long, slow process, unfortunately. Yeah. Anybody else's opinion on that? Uh, yeah, I'll, I'll chime in on that more for our, because uh, this has been coming up. We do manage a lot of retail strip centers in the area. And a lot of those are in areas where the, um, the zoning is a little bit more friendly to look at change for affordable housing. So as a lot of our owners have those retail strip centers who are panicking about unloading those, you know, probably wrongly, but they are seeing the writing on the wall with their tenants taking so long to come back. Those are development opportunities to change zoning into affordable housing. Um, that's what we're seeing on our retail strip centers. We have about three of them right now that were, uh, were we were already approached by the cities um, to, um, to look at a development potential on those. So, um, you know, we're seeing that opportunity on the retail strip centers. And Michael and Steven, since we have Steven here as well, what are you guys seeing as far as, um, as you look forward another six to 12 months, do you see your cap rate significantly changing the, in the East Bay marketplace, Oakland and surrounding areas? Or do you guys expect to stay similar to where you're at now? Depending on the markets, I think that, you know, a lot of the statistics that are coming out showing a, a double digit decline in rents, I think are seem to be more on like the higher end rental market, let's say institutional properties. A lot of the smaller buildings that we're working here, East Oakland, West Oakland, kind of workforce housing, we're seeing rents kind of hold on strong and then we're also able to work with different subsidy groups. So as long as rents sustain, then you might see a three to 5% decline 
And if interest rates could settle back down into the high threes, even low fours, I think that what investors are going to want is somewhere between like 100 to 150 basis point spread between where they can get the interest rate and cap rates. So I think depending on the upside of the rent roll or the, the difference between current rents and future rents, um, we're probably going to see somewhere between about a five and a half, six cap on current with a six and a half, seven percent market cap rate. Um, in the beginning of the year, kind of the deal that we were bringing out with interest rates at three and three quarters, we were able to push them at five, five and a quarter cap rate deals. So you're seeing cap rates going up about maybe a half a percent. Um, and that is if we can kind of still hold strong with, with, with rents, working with the different subsidies and everything else in, uh, in some of these kind of these different areas of Oakland and everything. Yeah, that's that's great. I love I love your insight there. Well, thank you guys all for your contribution today. That's uh, invaluable information for everyone because I I think that whether it's commercial or residential, you know, you know, it affects each other because the people who are renting are you know the next first time home buyer group, and and it'll be curious to like I'll I'll want to redo this panel in ninety days uh, and see see where things are at because I think it's moving at such a quick um, clip right now. I think it'll be great to reevaluate and see where things are moving. So thank you guys all for your contribution today. So I want to switch gears here um, and, and move uh, towards um, our next speakers. And we have now created an affiliation with American Home Shield. Uh, American Home Shield, for those that are not aware of that, um, and then make sure that everybody's uh, off of mute. Um, uh, We've been working with American Home Shield in some of our markets for, for quite a while and had incredible success. And part of, part of what we're gonna do today is we're gonna keep rolling out more and more services for the consumers and for the agents. Our goal is to continue to bring uh, strategic alliances so that we can work in partnership together. And, um, and with that, I'm gonna turn it over to, uh, to Jill and Jeremy and, and the rest of the team. So, um, you guys want to take it? Absolutely. Thanks. Yep. Great. Thanks so much, Rick. Um, we are excited to be working more closely with you guys as uh, we're launching in some other markets. So wanted to first start with an overview. I'm going to start um, with a quick introduction of our team in Southern California, and then I'm going to toss it to Jill, who is hmm. going to introduce Northern Cal. So for those of you in Southern California, uh, Pam Turner is your dedicated support for Santa Monica, Palisades, and Brentwood office. And Nikki DeProsperis um, will be supporting you in Newport Beach. And then Carrie Portman is our business development manager for SoCal, works in co coordination with Pam and Nikki and myself. And I am the regional director for SoCal. Jill, Northern Cal. Thank you. Thank you, Jeremy. My cat's deciding that he wants to join the call today. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so um, for Northern California, we have Stone Quatch who handles the um, Bay Area and Carmel, Monterey County. Kim Larkin has San Francisco and San Mateo County. And Kim Pratt has uh, Alameda County. So those of you in those offices will see them uh, either virtually or eventually when, when we're able to get out there. Um, I'm the business development director for Northern California, and I also work on national accounts. And then we have an inside team, Stacy Berg um, and Tammy Bagby, who helps us with our um, sales and service support. So you've got a team behind these, these um, account managers that are helping to get and move things along as far as sales and uh, any service support. And then Evo Georgie is the regional team leader in Northern California, team manager. Um, and then collectively, we all will be working together to certainly support this effort and provide you the service that you all know, love, and deserve. So are there, and Kim Pratt has um, also Contra Costa County. Someone's asking that. Okay. So you want to, you guys want to explain the the process here and yes. just tell me what you want me to click for because I'm controlling. So this. 
um, I'll just, I'll, uh, I'll go over this very briefly. You can go to the next slide, but I'm, I want you all to know that the last um, two years, American Home Shield has really uh, transformed. Uh, we were purchased, well, actually not purchased. We, we broke off of Service Master, who was our parent company for um, all the duration until two years ago. So Front Door is now our parent company and our senior leadership is um, all from the high tech industry. So what we're seeing today is very different than what we used to do um, back in the day. So you're gonna see uh, providing home services that you can go to the next slide, Rick. Um, oh, wait, where we're being more, more preventative versus, um, you get advanced, please. Oh, Jill, I just wanna add something on that. Sorry, uh -huh. sorry, That's Rick. Okay. <laughs> I just think you guys, the reason that this is so important is, you know, to Rick's comment at the beginning of this, who you work with matters, right? And especially from a home warranty standpoint, we know that we're going to be touching your client for that year after close. And so as you see us talk through this, we're no longer in the home warranty space. We've kind of made that transition to home services and it becomes a really powerful combination. Absolutely. Thank you, Jeremy. So the next slide shows um, where the current home warranty industry was really all about when things break, you contact us. And we're really um, hitting this uh, in a little different sense. We're doing that as well. Um, but we're also adding services that we're calling move-in services that you don't have to have something break to utilize it. So it's really a positive experience from the beginning. And the first thing is rekey, which you will see that um, others are copying us, which is a great compliment. However, you know, that's the first thing. When we close escrow, we get a rekey out there. We have a welcome call and um, offer to schedule their rekey service right out of the gate. So they're, they're understanding they have a home warranty. They understand that um, it's a great service and it's, it's proactive and it's a nice experience, something didn't break. And then moving more into the future, we are looking at to adding other services, carpet cleaning, pool, I don't know about instruction, but probably how to take care of your pool, pest control. Um, we have technology right now through our company stream where we have um, offered it to some real estate agents across the company as a pilot during COVID where we um, are helping you guys keep your business is flowing. So really working more in a um, succinct partnership. So you can move forward, please. There we go. So three plans, the Shield Essential, Shield Plus, Shield Complete, and then we have Sellers Coverage, which is our Shield Essential. And um, know that with either one, any of these three plans, you're going to get what you normally would be upgrading with the com competition it's included in all of the plans. So um, be sure that we're, we're combining what we feel and what your customers and homeowners have told us are important for their protection. You wanna to move to the next slide? Thank you. And by that, we're calling it livable and forgivable coverage. And that would be lack of maintenance, rust and corrosion, settlement, mismatch systems, improper installation, removal of equipment, permits, and code violations. These are all typically um, coverages that you have to pay extra for, and these are included in every one of our plans. So you don't have to worry about upgrading, if you will. Go ahead. And on-demand services, we can skip through that, but I've already kind of discussed that with regard to the HVAC tune-ups, what's being proactive. And so, um, we really just wanted to say thank you and um, really are excited about this new partnership. So Rick, we really appreciate that. Um, your team will be reaching out to all of the managers to get on hopefully your next uh, office call while we're still doing Zooms. I'm not sure when we're gonna be in person, but we're certainly here to help and support you through this process. Thank you guys. I, I want to share a little bit of the bigger vision so that people understand, well, what are what, this before I introduce our, our next speaker is, again, we started rolling out the concierge program. Well, I can tell you right now that the concierge program 
is now ready to go and we're going to be fully rolling it out. They had to make some tweaks to it, but we'll be rolling that out um, two weeks from today, which is extremely exciting. We're putting all the various components onto the concierge platform so that you guys have an integrated platform that's very, very consumer focused. So when we talk about California concierge, California concierge is the umbrella company. We're breaking it into four areas. It's the consumer concierge, the agent concierge, the broker concierge, and the affiliate concierge. The affiliate concierge interacts and supports the agent direct to consumers. So as we're bringing pieces onto this platform, it's to provide better service for you as agents with the consumer experience and do it in a way that either that we're trying to make it so you don't have any costs as an agent when it's products and services that you would normally pay for, or it's service for your clients at an affordable rate that inter interacts. And if we can, <clears throat> the more that we can get these to talk to each other and benefit us all, it's gonna make the consumer experience that much better for client retention and, and, and through the process. So again, our goal is gonna be in partnerships like this, like when this consumer, when your consumer um, has to utilize the American Home Shield uh, warranty, you guys get, a, there's gonna be a notification that something happened down the house. When you get a notification, it will signal for you to say, hey, I need to reach out to this client of mine and say, hey, I see that you had to get your, your roof had to be repaired. Um, how, are, how are things going? So part of it is, is it all is an ecosystem that works together. And so, um, so without further ado, I'm going to introduce our next, um, our next partner moving forward, and that is Inspectify. And I want to have them um, weigh in on, uh, I want to make sure, are you guys off of, uh, you guys off of mute here? Go ahead and take, uh, take it with Inspectify. So explain what Inspectify is, and let's, um, let's talk about what that does for the agents. Are you guys off of mute? If you if you're still on mute, um, hit Lynn Malone uh, and and let her. She probably doesn't see your screen name to get you off of get off get off of mute. So <clears throat> yeah, I don't know who they are. I'm sorry. I don't know. I don't have any names. Okay, I'm trying to scroll here. You guys on mute. So just hit, just go to the chat and, and, uh, and Lynn, will, Lynn will take you off of mute. So I want to, um, and while, while they jump on, so Inspectify, imag imagine this, like, so consider Inspectify almost like the, the Keller Williams, our group's, um, uh, Angie's list of service providers. So what do I mean by that? Like, Let's say that I've got my general inspector and I like my general inspector and I just use them. But let's say that you want a roofer and you don't have a roofer or uh, a chimney person and things like that. They not only have this we, we a vetted list, but a list that can, can not only be available to you as an agent, but also to your clients um, as a resource for, um, for actually doing inspections and setting up those appointments and, and things like that. Um, so, so, the, the amount of time that it takes to actually call your clients, call the other agent, set all this stuff up is part of what we're trying to do. So if we can help you guys to be more efficient by using this product to do it, that's going to immediately help quite a bit. In addition, it's, it's, um, it's the ability to then take, take the cost of these inspections and actually put it in through escrow so the client doesn't have to pay at the time when the inspection is happening. So that also is a great part of the service as part of it. So we have them on, we able to get them online? We're having trouble getting some people onto our system here. Um, well, I will tell you this, what we'll do is we will, we will do this, uh, how about we move this to next week and I'll just have them roll it out um, during next week's session. But um, I'm excited to have this rolled out. We're, our, our goal with Inspectify overall is to, roll this out over the next week or two and, and let you guys see what that is. And I actually have screenshots of the portal of what it would be to, um, to get your clients onto there and get that through the process. So I wanted to move to one thing I want to really cover today. And, um, and that is a little bit about the PPP. How many people thumbs up on uh, 
the PPP and what's happening there. Did you guys know that there was um, the forgiveness loan was extended? There was some changes to this. So what happened on Friday is they've given and made some changes to this. So with bipartisan support, um, the bill was passed. And, and what it is, is instead of an eight week process, so 56 days, causing it really difficult to figure out your payroll and having to potentially create an, um, uh, a mid-period mid payroll payment to make it work, they've now extended it. So they've extended it to 24 weeks. In addition, they've changed the payroll versus non-payroll percentage. And so it can go up to 40% can be non-payroll now. So what is, what's in that 40%? So it would be your rent. So when you're paying rent, it would be like your car, your automobile, your gas, your, some of your expenses. So check with your own CPA, but find out what can be covered under that PPP. So if you've gotten the PPP money and you're looking for the forgiveness portion, it's extremely more um, reasonable now on getting the full amount forgiven. Also, in re in if with the, the EIDL portion or the 1,000 per, per head for your employees, that has now moved from the two years to the five years. Or if you don't have the full amount of the PPP forgiven, then any, any remaining amount that wasn't forgiven will be then actually to be paid over a five-year period versus a two-year period. So again, I wanted to explain some of those changes that are occurring, and I thought it would be helpful to, um, to uh, talk about that. So um, any questions on, on that? Um, so question, can you apply on both the, both loans, the EIDL and the PPP? Yes, we did both the EIDL and the PPP, the EIDL loan portion of it. So they, up to a $10,000, they gave you an initial grant and that money would just be granted if you didn't do the PPP. However, if you did the PPP in addition to the EIDL, then you would reduce your ability on the PPP by the amount that you got. Again, it'd be a thousand per head. So six employees, it would, you would have to reduce your amount by 6,000 on the PPP. And um, you could get the EIDL were originally up to 2 million. We haven't seen anything over 150,000 per company. And, and, and again, you can pick the amount. And so you should get a, you would get an email. It would say, um, disaster, uh, the customer service disaster relief loan, I believe. It's under the SBA and you'll see a green button on it to click there. And it would authenticate who you are and ask you to pick your loan up to a maximum amount of, again, 150,000. You pick the loan, you go through that process and then you uh, push submit and then you wait. And, and in some cases, we've been waiting for two weeks on an approved loan before they give us loan documents. Once you sign loan documents, it's about a 48 hour window and then you get paid. Um, um, you'll see the money just arrive in your bank account. Um, that, uh, that amount of money, again, um, you know, ask your CPA on how you should record that money. And, and again, I'm not sure things are, things are changing quite, uh, quite a bit on what is going to be your tax liability for the money that came in. That's the grant money, um, both from the IRS and separately from the state. It looks like the IRS may forgive it where the state may not. So anyway, as, as, as we see that um, coming about, we will, we will share that with you. I think that uh, we won't have a final determination on that, but we will let you know in the next couple of weeks. Um, if you only received a small loan, can you apply for another one through any government loans? Uh, you cannot apply for a second loan under Again, if you've got a PPP and you received it and they only gave you up to say $10,000 and you want more, you can't go through that means uh, through the SBA. You have to go, uh, I believe, to, you know, to a bank or, or someone else for additional funding. Any other questions? And otherwise, I will let you guys go. And again, please be, uh, you know, please be safe. Again, we still have a virus that seems to be going up. And we need to uh, need to be very cognizant of that. And uh, please be safe, be focused, and uh, and we'll talk to you again next week.
Thanks so much. Bye bye. Thanks, Ray. So good. Thank you. Bye, Rick. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye.